Hello and welcome to Apples and Snakes at Home. This is series three, episode two. Um, my name is Bridget Minmore and I'm your host for this evening. If you were with us last week um, with the wonderful Ioni and Casey uh, from the Midlands, you will know that series three is focusing on the theme of home with artists exploring the idea of belonging in an increasingly fragmented world. Um, this episode will feature performances from two of my absolute faves, uh, Hibak Osman, uh, say hi Hibak. Hiya. <laughs> and Inua Ellums, say hi Inua. What's up? Hi. <laughs> um, as well as a specifically commissioned poem from Sana Asan. Uh, I'm really excited for today. We are, we've left the Midlands. We are now in London, London, London town. Um, but opposite sides, Hibak is in West, Inua is in South. I am in South, but in an attempt to attempt at neutrality, I will pretend that I am in Central or maybe East uh, to bring, to, you know, really solve that uh, West-South divide, maybe the biggest divide happening in the world right now that's not true but it feels it sometimes um welcome guys thank you so much for being here with us and with me yeah uh, thank you for having us thanks for having us yeah this is cool good um home 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 Inua, where's home uh, <laughs> i've asked, I've <laughs> asked because i have a show called an evening with an immigrant i'm asked this question a lot and i give the same answer and I've given it so much, it sounds like a cliche in my own head, um, but it's true. Home is my laptop. It's this, um, it's this screen here that I spend most of my time in front of when I'm writing. And it's the most um, familiar four corners to me, more so than my flat, um, because um, well, before lockdown, I traveled immensely and I was working in theaters in different spaces constantly. Uh, um, so, um, what I'm most familiar with is this four screens of my of my MacBook Pro. Um, her name is Meredith. Uh, we've been in a relationship for about two three years right now, um, and this is this is her. This is this is home for me. Well, hi Meredith. Hi Meredith. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad everyone has met you, Meredith right now. Hit back. Uh, where is home for you? Um, realistically, anywhere my friends are. I think anywhere where there's people that I know and feel comfortable with, I think, can be home. But right now, West London. <laughs> <laughs> I think friendship is something that, um, yeah, has been, has, I think most of us have been reflecting on friendship in a big way over the past six months and, and that whole lockdown period. Um, I ended up accidentally reading a bunch of things that looked at friendship. Like I read Dennis Smith's latest collection. I read a couple of novels that looked at friendship. And I, I and but also wasn't seeing my friends yeah. and really found myself like adrift at home, even though I am at home in South East London. Um, have you been, how, how, how's it been like coming out of that? Because we're now in this weird half ground, right? Where we can see people, but we can't and we don't and we can and we might. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows what will happen between now and the next gig? I don't even know. Uh, it's been difficult. Like, I think. For me, I I sort of hole up a lot, so I really need to be pushing myself to like be out and see people, and that was sort of how I then centered myself again. And not having that, and or only having it through like technology, has been so jarring. And I don't think I'm like used to it at all. Uh, I didn't realize just how much I needed those moments of like breakout until now I think so it's a lot to think about and consider when everything does open up I'm just gonna go mad hugging my friends I think um for me it was really it was really hard um just before lockdown we had one of the biggest and most successful rap parties at the National Theatre which was a really beautiful beautiful moment and I'm such a tactile person that um, I found myself screaming after four weeks of not being able to hug anyone um, in, in, in lockdown and was and I live alone so it, it was it was really really hard um, and then things got to some normality and I was performing again in theaters and and it felt good even though I still had to socially distance like you have to touch people with our elbows and stuff right. like that. Um, and now that we're returning um, we're returning to what it was before um, I think, I think 
it might even be more difficult because now we know what we don't have again mm -hmm. and also this is the period of christmas of winter where it's colder where you you do need to be even more tactile and families traditionally would group around each other but now you can't really really do that so um i don't know i think i i'm, I'm really anxious about about the forthcoming months and what winter does generally to people in this country but also people of color who are, um, are really dependent on vitamin d from the sunlight and there are studies to do with um um you know depression and 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 malnutrition from sunlight and how that affects us so um I, yeah I'm, I'm doubly nervous because yeah. of that yeah. Um, I mean, if you're not taking your vitamin D supplements, especially you people of colour out there, uh, <laughs> that's one thing I think anyone who is a friend of mine knows me around this time of year, I start to get sort oh, of yeah. medical about uh, the supplements. But you need to you need to look after yourself. Like home, we can talk about our, our external homes, but our internal homes, our bodies are just as important. Mm. Um, and if you don't know, uh, um, Apples and Snakes for this entire series around home uh, decided to amplify the voices of underrepresented groups by focusing all of the programming on black and brown artists living in England, um, specifically because we may, we often do feel at home in more than one place or identity. And I think both of your work in your and back is something that really, so I really wanted you to, to be part of this just because it really, yeah, your, both of your work makes me think about the shifting nature of home and um the shifting nature of self within those homes as well um so yeah i might use that as a way to pivot into our first poetry reading um i'm so excited we're going to start with Hibak Osman today. Hibak Osman is a Somali writer born and based in London, in West London, very important to specify, I think. Um, her work centres women, identity and the healing process. A Silence You Can Carry, her debut poetry pamphlet was published with Outspoken Press in 2015. And in, two and in October 2020, like literally, oh, it's in October, oh, it's in October. no, we're not. God, yeah. where's the year gone? Um, Last month, Hibak released her first full poetry collection, Where the Memory Was, as part of Jacaranda Books' 20 in 2020 initiative. Uh, if you haven't got that new collection, please do. If you haven't got Hibak's odd pamphlets, please go get it. But for now, I'm going to leave you with Hibak's wonderful words, where hopefully we'll hear from one or both of those beautiful bodies of work. Um, cool, so I'm going to read actually from the new collection. Um, for this piece and it's thinking about home uh, I've thought a lot about my family and sort of how they've traveled around and and for me one of the first like stories of those is my grandma um, leaving her city for another city and living a nomadic life and so there's a poem about that uh, it's titled packing two gold necklaces when there is talk of warriors Rarely do they mention the keepers of secrets or how whole cities have been moved under the cloak of night. What tiresome work it is to carry lineage, which is to hold your great grandmother and great grandchild in one hand and a tasbih in the other. You say, inshallah, God will free us and prepare for the unknown often water, often death. When there is talk of warriors, the bustle of kitchens is omitted, but recipes are strategically altered in new weather, on new lands. And isn't a sword just a knife that has been repurposed, which proves you have made do behind the curtains of suns and into the long memories of your daughters, whose minds are a maze of language that cannot translate your name. Nobody will speak of what you left behind to carry us forward, least of all yourself. Instead, Allahu Alam, God knows best. Um, poem for the city and specifically my estate which is going through a gentrification process uh, titled On Home.
I have left so many words on these walls. Whoever moves in next will be haunted. Maybe I am who I am because the ghosts who lived here before me wear my skin like cloak. It is hard to be yourself with your head hanging out of an 11th floor window. So many people have thrown themselves into the car park and waiting on the Vice documentary. Last summer, they closed off the communal water fountains. During the Olympics, they told us there would be snipers on our roof. We now have two small Sainsbury's that nobody can afford to buy from, but I guess it's nice to have something new. I keep reading signs about women being attacked. I keep forgetting my keys. Sometimes the sun hits all six buildings at once and I think about who will make money off this next. It won't be us. I read poems to my bedroom and it says nothing back. Why are you still here? The boys downstairs sink into the benches when they see me, walking proof that there is no way out. I used to believe this building was cursed. They wonder how it lets a curse like me move so freely. Thank you. That was um, a poem that I wrote actually for a project that I did with, well, Bridget was part of the project as well with Garden Magazine um, on their explorations of home. It's part of uh, one of my online pamphlets, not the new book, I should have clarified. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Ibak. That was beautiful. Um, I'm thinking a lot about just just generational home, and I think both of those poems touched on that, touched on um, the things we carry from mm -hmm. the people before us and our parents and our family and our lineage, but also just on an estate, how how so much of the, the, the geography or the psychogeography of estates in the inner city um, in inner city London re revolve around this sort of generational hierarchy like this is you know you don't you don't really go here if you're under this age or if you're over that okay. age and that shifts and changes um is home has home changed over the years for you that like in a in a in that way yeah definitely I mean when sort of being raised in the same place my, my whole life in the same house and then moving out when when I started uni or like just trying to get away from the house when I started uni and then coming back to it all the time I kind of I think it hit a little deeper that actually this was home and sort of like the idea that being you know working class and and being from an estate and being black that you're meant to strive to make it out of this place but actually realizing it's the one place that you feel totally comfortable in. I think that was a massive realization for me and why I probably always think of not just this house, but this building, this, the six buildings next to me, the whole estate in general as home, um, no matter how much it changes. So definitely the idea of home has changed over the years. What you just said is really interesting to think about what our parents wish for us. Versus mm -hmm. You know, they want us to be better than them. And for them, that means and excuse the cliche phrase to get out the hood. But sometimes right. the hood is the safest place for us, you know, and trying to understand and trying to communicate that um, safety might be more important than um, um, socioeconomic mobility is, mm -hmm. is, a, is a really intricate covers question to have with your parents, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, there's a sort of story slash TV episode that I'm working with where I'm, I'm trying to have that exact same conversation mm -hmm. between a young man who just wants to remain um, um, a crossing guard, like a lollipop lady, you know, but that's, that does all he wants to do to look after his community that way, mm -hmm. which is a mother who wants him to, beca to become a banker and for mm -hmm. him he to protect his home. He wants, he wants to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's the ongoing conversation that I, that I hope we're trying to have in with these poetry and with these conversations and with these episodes, but mm. the tensions between safety and home and then home is often safety, but also that safety isn't necessarily safe right. in, in, in the capital S sort of sense. Um, yeah, God, so many thoughts. Okay. Anyway, um, 
more poems here back please yeah Keep so <laughs> <laughs> on that same kind of idea of lineage um this one is titled a brief history it's in three parts so i'll just let you know which one is which a brief history we scheduled our family holidays around court dates never took the same route home some things were only to be spoken about in the house with the door locked after the school run Kids are fast, but rumours are faster. Mm. Serenity was what we borrowed from neighbours in half-cup weight. Shared anything but the shame. What is ours is yours, but don't ask about our son or our daughter or the children before that. Mohammed was splashed with acid and moved north. Our family has a habit of doing that, moving until the past stops chasing. I haven't seen him since the news. Scandal in the blood and scandal in the soil, spilling out of everything that is created with this name. Two. In many ways, my brothers and sisters are not my brothers and sisters. That's how documentation goes. Take what you can get and it will save you in the long run, or at least until the resilience is battered out of you. I think these blocks were made of the same clay my mother is made of. Tall and strong, but never warm. We've passed the oldest daughter curse back and forth between us. A no match transfusion that will surely take one before the other, I pray it's me. In this house that is not a home, we have four walls made of grief and a ceiling made of disappearances that were never explained like Avera's limbs that suddenly vanished as if they decided his body or this land could not contain them. Three. Was it the schizophrenia? Was it the schizophrenia? Was it the schizophrenia? Is it coming for me next? My grandma told me I look like her. Big in the same ways, but too quiet, she says. Like my mother, she says, too many secrets in my eyes. I have held her hands as if the peace in her palms could free me. While she asks what took me so long to visit, why I'm not staying. If I have to choose between my father's name and my mother's, I choose calamity. I choose the sickness that will surely follow. I choose recognizing what cannot be healed like this house, this mind, and these names. I choose staying anyway. Thank you. Oh. God, it's been so long since I've heard you read. It's been so long since I've heard anyone read in person anyway, but that felt like you were just reading to me in my house. Um, yeah, beautiful. Um, is oh where to start i guess um, oh you saying something you know? yeah just um the very first lines of that very first um part of the poem um you could have been writing about my family it was it was that close we scheduled our holidays around court dates mm -hmm. um we had the longest immigration case my family and i and it's still ongoing and yeah, there were times um, where we couldn't travel because of court dates, because of okay. appearances. Um, and uh, my parents were so terrified and nervous that um, just like you said, we couldn't talk about certain things until we were behind closed doors with the door firm. Mm -hmm. We created an illusion of safety that we were here now. You mm -hmm. know, we could speak unguarded. So there was something just so precise and universal um, mm -hmm. in those lines. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, Hibak is, um, okay, we'll start there then because you just brought that into my head. Um, mm -hmm. it, do you feel that, the, I'm just wondering about the conversations we have around this stuff, around the links with, between migration and home. And obviously we know like on a real basic sense, 
um, so often this country just doesn't do those conversations very well. Right. I'm curious about what you set out to do when, when, when with your own conversations, like, is it, is it, do you start with the image or do you start with the, with the talk and the chatter around it when you write a poem like that? Um, this one, this one in particular definitely started with a conversation, mm. um, both with other people and, and with myself, I think. Mm. Um, just mostly it started from me realising that I'm probably the first member of my family to stay in one place for a long time. Um, I.e. like being born here and staying here from birth and not moving um, and thinking about how despite that being the case, there's still been so much disruption um, in my life and the idea of movement is still very present in my life. Um, and so is this sort of dream to just get away, which is, I think, just maybe in my bloodstream, it just runs through my family line. Um, and in particular, thinking about how um, my mum is raised nomadic, so my dad was a city guy but my mom was always sort of in the middle of nowhere and traveling and um how when there's a level of safety in that that isn't found in being in a country like this that's meant to be super stable and you know safe uh for people and i think that's mostly where the piece came from was this idea that there is all this movement coming to me and through me that I'm actually not really partaking in. Um, I'm just here, but because of history, I have now this urge, much like my mum, to sort of constantly be on the move. Uh, whether that's feasible or not is a different <laughs> different question, but I think that's where, where it's come from and it's something I come back to a lot and whether, I guess this idea of maybe like, is that a spiritual calling? Like, is that just in, in our lineage like is are we not meant to be somewhere for as long as we have been and how does it affect us if we are i think that's mostly the questions i was thinking about when writing for sure i mean those are just the endless questions right do we are we supposed to be here or not are we supposed to be in one place or not because my right. family quite similarly you know even like little things like i went to i, I just took a day a day trip to brighton yesterday i just needed to see the sea mm. in a while and um you know my dad he grew up right by the volta in ghana and my whole family on that side have always been near the near, been near water and my mom's always saying you know uh, and i don't even love swimming or anything that much but it's more just being able to see the horizon feels really yeah. important and necessary and i'm like is it just because i like it or is it something deeper and uh, mm -hmm. more is it in the blood so i just need to be able to see that water to feel like I'm, I'm leveled out right. um yeah god so many questions so many questions around home um it's it's painful um but it's also it's also kind of great like that we can have these questions um yes. have you got any more poems for us yes um my final two Amazing. uh <laughs> a lot of the the collection there's a section that mostly deals with the idea of home and family uh, and this is if I can find it this is another piece for my grandma on the hands of the saved there will be no stains we are born of what we bear and the charm that follows a father ma has repented for children she may never meet we're sure she has kept us here following the starlight to say amin and kiss her souls. Darkness as henna has made itself home in the gaps between her fingers. What scars could last here? What history would be worthy? We are born of charm and we bear what follows. There is a suitcase with both your names on it, carried like shield wherever you moved or stayed. Soil from every city, and an etching from each lover. A father ma has repented for children she may never meet. A newborn hidden in the petals of her palm. We say Amin and kiss her souls. 
Thank you. Um, my last poem comes back to the idea that sometimes people are home and um, uh, yeah, <laughs> a love poem in this sometimes very gloomy and dark city. We sounds better than you and me. I've been warned not to walk too much in areas where the lights seem to nothing and bodies end up in canals. You tell me to be safe. Don't lurk. I take comfort in knowing that an estate is an estate is an estate. The next morning, I tell you raspberry is my favorite flavor dessert. You say it doesn't count. I count it. Isn't everything better with a little bit of first? You disagree. What's the point if all you can take from it is pain? Can't you just let anything be good? This is good, I say. This city is good. Or I could catch an Uber. I could engage with a stranger who will always ask me if I'm dating or married or if perhaps I am too young. Baby face for a baby girl, one will say. I do not recount these stories to you who will tell me next time, don't get an Uber. Let me call you a proper cab. As if the white men are any different. To get to you, I could always catch an Uber. You peel the fruit slices off your upside down cake, set them by the tea bag. I mumble that my next poem will be about you and you better not die before I finish it. If time could hold us hostage, I'd ask for it to keep us there. You question why it has to be death or nothing. I don't mind how you get here. Just come. I'll title it Raspberry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm using myself to like um, clap. Oh. oh, you ended on a nice positive note. How lovely. Yeah, I had to, otherwise <laughs> <laughs> it'd get quite dark in here. <laughs> That doesn't happen enough, but I'm I'm into it. We can be happy poets. We can try, you know. Romantic that um, when you were reaching towards this conclusion, I was I was half expecting you to write. I don't care how you get here, just get here if you can. <laughs> <laughs> Is that song by? If you get here, get here if you can. I don't, I don't even know. I can't remember, but I remember the song. I remember the song too. Um, if it wasn't a breach of copyright, I would play it right now. Right. <laughs> um, but I don't want Apples and Snakes to get sued by whoever. EMI or Universal or something. <laughs> right. Yeah, but it was a really lovely point. Could you ask a little question about just the ending? I'll title mm. it Raspberry. Mm. Um, what were you driving towards with that? I like it. It feels like a cherry on a cake. Like it's, 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 it's reducing to that, it, that image, that final gift. Mm. Uh, what you were sort of riffing on or um I was just thinking about how flavors mostly and how <laughs> how every flavor I tend to like is is something with like a tang and um the person who is in the poem never understood that and I think it was always like a sort of running thing was that everything I liked had to have a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of like a punch in it yeah. And it just reminded me so much of the city that we're in, um, where I feel like I'm constantly making excuses and trying to argue my case for London. Um, and <laughs> like, no, 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 but it's, it's great. <laughs> and yeah, that's why. Okay, I love that. Oh, that's so interesting. I, I'm the same. I only like fruit with like a punt, like raspberries and kiwis are the, are the main mm. fruit that I eat. Apart from when, I only ever eat sort of, I call them flat flat fruits when I go to Ghana yeah. where somehow the flatness is fine so I can have coconut water there or coconuts or even things like apples and bananas mm. which I don't really like here but there maybe because I'm not so much on edge right I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> is it Freudian or is it just what I like I don't know my like, the eternal <laughs> monologue right about home that's better though <laughs> could just be that but food is just so much a part of, of our relationship with home, isn't it? Like, just in the most bait, big way, like, mm -hmm. what you eat and where tells you where you are in yeah. the world and how at home you feel. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Oh, God, how... 
Oh, yeah, just... Uh, one more thing, just because I'm curious, mm. thinking about people as, as homes. Do you know a lot of people who are homes? Mm. I wouldn't say a lot. Mm. I wouldn't say a lot. Um, I think I'm also just naturally quite a guarded person, so uh, I don't like to open <laughs> in that way. To a lot of people so I don't think I can say a lot but I think it's more that when I'm in a, in a room full of people I may not necessarily know them all and I may not necessarily have a direct relationship with them all but I could say that room feels very homely I feel like that room is home that space is home um, but my nearest and dearest yeah I'd say they, they're definitely my home. Beautiful. In you are a lot of people are, that are homes in your life? Um, not a lot. Besides my three sisters and my parents, maybe um, a handful of friends who sometimes we don't go, we don't speak for weeks, but mm. we start speaking and no time has passed. And there's just mm. informality. There is, there's a really dear friend of mine who lives in Nigeria. Sometimes I don't, we don't, I don't see him for like maybe two to three years. But when we do, is it if we're both, there's just an understanding. It's, it's so weird sometimes. Yeah. Um, and I found a poem, curiously enough, which, which described and better articulated what I'm driving at. And I sent it to her. When she read it, she just started laughing because she knew. The poem was explaining how horses sort of give birth to horses and the already born horses. They just, they just know. They're just already cantering. Um, and, and, and just something so solid and erect and informal. And yeah, so there the may be a handful of people who are homes and mm. are, my, my, my dear friend. That's so, that's really interesting to me because I have a friend like that as well. I've, I have a couple, but there is one in particular who because of lockdown or because of quarantine rather, um, we've been more like obvious about contacting each other. And so, she used to live in um she went to university in the states and I went to visit her out there and that was like stayed there for a bit and then she lived in London last year and now she's back home in Lagos and it's like now we have this thing because of lockdown where it doesn't matter that we're not in the same place as much um and we're trying to be more forceful about continuing that because we've realized actually just how important we are to each other and that we can just pick up where we left off months back or you know weeks back so i definitely relate to that i think i know the poem you're talking about as well yeah. wow. in that's beautiful and i think it's something that happens with poetry generally right you see these poets that you only see once every like yeah months and it's like hello um a bit like now um, right. thank you so much for your sight here back that was absolutely beautiful thank you so much for sharing those poems with us um we are gonna have we're going to watch our video, our specially commissioned uh, poem, uh, which I'm really excited to see. The, it's a piece from Senna Hassan, who is a poet who um, I first saw at one of the news rap parties because we were both seeing it together. And I was that a year ago because that was Halloween. Yeah, oh my God, Halloween. that was so long ago. But she just blew me away she's brilliant um she's a spoken word artist a channel Four reporter and a tedx speaker uh she won the outspoken poetry prize performance poetry prize for her piece my do it is love in 2019 her recent work includes being a consultant speaker on the women of color and mental health panel at the 2020 women of the world festival as well as hosting a conversation at the tape modern about queer muslim women's experiences uh and she's a great poet uh, I'm so excited to watch this video. So na Hassan. I am still waiting to arrive in this body. Sometimes my hand wanders, lost in sleepless nights. Tips of these fingers stumble through untamed forestry. I grow wiry hairs on these shins until they resemble the skin of my emasculated father. Yet still, I cannot unbecome my mother. I cannot unbecome my mother 
in those stiff trousers. This Eid, I will fashion a gurda instead of a sari. I will fashion a gurda instead of a sari. Ooh, amazing. Um, that has filled me with loads of thoughts. I'm mostly thinking about clothing and our relationship to home and clothing and the things that we wear. Um, what, a, what, a, what a peaceful video. I wasn't expecting it. I don't know why. I think when I think of home, um, I expect someone to, to commission to write something that's a bit angrier or a bit more like painful rather than these beautiful, like, natural scenes mm. but maybe that's just me I don't know it was also quite nice to have the the sort of nat the, those natural sounds and then like mm. quite a piercing voice at sometimes as well mm -hmm. um next to each other that was that was really beautiful to listen to yeah I think I really like the visuals because um maybe there's a way that it is assumed people of color, immigrants, discuss home. And there was a surprise, and serenity was, was the surprising thing. Like for her, it wasn't a bone of contention, or at least it wasn't entirely that, and was realized in, in the serenity she found in discussing, in discussing home. Um, there, there's, this, um, there's this idea sometimes of performing our, our, our pain or presenting that because it's, it's um, it's it's financially lucrative, or it's or it's, or it's a stereotype, <laughs> right? Mm. And um, sometimes I think creatives are guilty of doing so, and sometimes the braver thing is to present a count a counter narrative to what is expected of us, um, even and to create and even within that there is conflict, there is tension to be enjoyed in given in given something that is unexpected. So I think some are lent into that. Completely. I think it's why um, when I went to see Rocks in the cinema, a film, which just had a real sense of home and London as home for the girls in the film. But one, one of the moments in that film, which I did love, that I love the most, was when the two teenage girls, uh, one's a black Nigerian uh, heritage girl, one's a black Somali heritage girl. And the girl from the Somali family has like a big, close family with like her mom her dad her older siblings her various cousins it's her brother's wedding so there's lots going on and the girl the Nigerian girl who grew up with a single mother and a little brother and no one else really just a grandma who lives in Nigeria half the time they're having this argument and she says something the Nigerian girl says something around like you know you you have everything mm. and it made me so happy because it, it it was the first time I'd seen that articulated that for so many immigrants children like everything isn't this this perceived like i want a big house in west london in like i don't know labrick grove that's like got pillars and a white family at the door and like no like the dream family was like a big close sprawling somali family with lots of love and food and games and that was what i knew growing up growing up and and actually to and you know we're all guilty of it aren't we mm -hmm. of like leaning into the maybe negatives or the stereotypes but actually there was so much joy and light and love and it's so hard to remember that that is equally as important to, to talk about definitely yeah. i think that like with with family like structures like that where it's very very communal whether that's um directly sort of blood blood related families or people you grew up with or just wider community um mm. there's often a certain amount of chaos as well and a certain amount of like um the, an, an, an undercurrent sometimes of some other things going on that you might not be fully aware of when you're younger and then as you grow up you sort of learn more about the family and you learn more about conflict and and all of that but I think f for me going off your point the older I got after that sort of well, this is all a bit mad. The older I got, the, the more I realized this is so comforting. Like that is, the chaos as well is comforting because that's what makes this very real. That's what makes, you know, all these people connect as well. Um, and I love that film for the same reasons, honestly. Mm, love it. I mean, I feel like I should only be promoting poets during these, but films, are, films can be poetry. And mm. that is 
film that was closest to poetry. Like, I was just like sobbing in the cinema. Um, yeah, so many thoughts, so many things. Uh, I'm so glad we had that. I feel so peaceful, which mm. I wasn't expecting to have in a conversation about home with a couple of uh, first and second gen immigrants. But here we are bucking those stereotypes. Um, we are going to go to our last <laughs> poet of the evening, um, the wonderful Inua Ellums, uh, also in South East London, so not that far away from me right this minute, but um, and also not that far in terms of the work uh, I, ex I believe he's going to read. Uh, born in Nigeria, he's a poet, a playwright, a performer, and a graphic artist and designer. He's the author of six books of poetry and has been commissioned by the Royal Shakespeare Company, the National Theatre, the Tate Modern, Louis Vuitton and the BBC. His latest poetry collection, The Actual, was published last month as well by Penned in the Margins. It's something you can get right this minute. Why not go on your phone, laptop, whatever you are watching uh, this gig on right now and order both Where the Memory Was and The Actual in a like double act thing. I don't know, maybe Apple should start shutting that on their website. That'd be good. <laughs> um, but for now, I'm going to hand over to Inua to read us some poems. Hi, um, thanks for, um, for asking me to do this. I'm going to read um, six poems in total um, um, and two um, 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 in Paris. Um, two in Paris? Yeah, in Paris. <laughs> I'm just going to read the poem. Um, the first is, I'm going to read is called The Child God of Chaos. I was commissioned to write this for um, Jigsaw, which is um, a clothing company. And this was um, staged into fabric and clothes and coats and t-shirts. And, um, and this, is, this is the first one. The Child God of Chaos. Her first scream splits the midwife's ring and cut the defibrillator's wires to confetti. Her giggling drove nursery schools to hysterics and her breaststroke rose tidal waves with each lap. Her bacon pillowed the whole house in clouds and dancing threatened its concrete foundations. Her singing caused the male choir's discord and stuttered the organist's fingers to a stop. Her driving lessons gave highways nightmares and her brake lights discoed traffic lights dead. Her kisses caused murmurs in a lover's heart and her lovemaking crushed hip bones to flower. Her runaway from home sparked a black hole and it grew to completely consume her friends. Her mood swings ruptured weather patterns and merest indifference iced over lakes. She heard of a hurricane making for the city and entering quietly, she swallowed the storm and found her life's calling and saved us all. The first poem, and the second is called um, The Wire-Headed Heathen. Um, this later um, became um, a title poem um, uh, of a pamphlet, which was, which was um, published a few years ago. And, um, and it's really, it's about um, aerial boys who are essentially <laughs> gangs of criminals that roam through through Lagos and it's about um when um they broke into our home and, and stole from us and whereas my uncle spent most of the time lambasting these criminals I was completely given to the mythology of them and they invaded our home and that's where the poem sort of begins the wire-headed heathen at first I imagined monsters a wire-headed heathen pride of beasts, soundlessness about their feet, a glowing red about their eyes, a thing reptilian about the spines they rolled on over the rust-sharp nails spiking the gates of our compound. They came in the small hours of, of an August dark, hot, thick as sin, pressing a stifling heat down on the zinc roof of our home, a squat fort of double locked doors, shatterproof French windows and iron bars they bent back miraculous, easy as breaking bread. Uncle, whose gift it is to speak the obvious, points out the space the TV filled, the missing VCR, vanished stacks of polished vinyl, the hi-fi fa hi also into thin air, the bars parted for a man's size, they came in this way, thieves in the night. Outside, my little sister cries for reasons she can't articulate. 
Mother sings of loss and betrayal, her pained voice frail by father's side. When she cries louder, mother's tongue flutters, tough as middle fingers, thrust against the cathedral of night. A righteous fire after the culprits, uncle says, must be those aerial boys, those hunger-scorched, weathered men at scene, once pressed against the windscreen, driving through Ajegunle. Men, impossibly tired, as if the country's weight lay on their shoulders. Atlas back, black men, of cutlass flash quickness, and other mother tongues of tonal codes rippling the Lagos underworld, who sip viper venom after a calabash of paraga and throw their head back, such hard laughter and moonlight flashing across their throats. Child napping men who target respectable homes, capture kids to teach the dark arts of strange agility and demon great strength. Only tough ones survive the grueling rites of passage. Some die, uncle says, his head hung low. Mine raised in hopes they kidnap just one more. Thank you. Thank you, Inia. Um, taking us to Lagos with that second poem. Um, I love, yeah, the mythology of the area boys is such a nice turn of phrase because they are this mythologized thing, aren't they? As, as, a, as, as a group, as a, or, but I guess what's, what's been particularly uh, interesting, painful, sad, all of those things over the past few weeks with everything that's been happening in Nigeria, in Lagos in particular, how that mythology has come to both intersect with so much violence and um and and what and how for some for us you know there's this mythologized idea of the area boy he's young he's got all this stuff that he's stolen but obviously for those with the power to enact so much violence from the state that same that mythology has gone to like criminality and for some reason my mythology and i'm assuming your mythology isn't isn't necessarily like evil criminal yeah. whereas for so many it is it's been yeah really really sad to see that i think it, it really is and um I, I was i was doing a project a sequence of silence which meant that i needed to in, interview a whole bunch of people right from from the from the lowest members of the working class community right up to the echelons of power and i spent um an afternoon in one of the largest markets in Lagos, um, just interviewing area boys. And the stories they told were, were really heartbreaking. Um, um, there's a subsect of, of area boys called, and they call themselves the born throwaways. Those people who are born and thrown away, literally means um, who are orphaned from, from birth. And um, just understanding the things that push them into into difficulty, into destitution, and, and 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 them telling you these stories and understanding why they're on the street was was really an incredibly humbling experience. And a lot of them live um, al alongside um, um, in Makoko, which is a floating village, uh, and you know close to the rivers in in Lagos that, that runs through the heart of the city. And the government have been over the last years decimating just bulldozing down a lot of their accommodations, which drive them into, into, into more precarious spaces and more precarious lives. And understanding that and thinking about the ways in which the, the huge um, officials who are leading this reconstruction of vast swathes of Lagos talk about it as this upcoming metropolis whilst the human, um, the, the human rights, you know, being eroded right, right in every way has been really, really, difficult to understand and therefore when things and the protests began, I completely understood it. It's it's been it's a keg waiting to explode and it has exploded. I just hope the changes the Nigerians have been requesting um come into fruition. Yeah. And it's yeah, a real reminder, I think all the NSOS protests and even the, seeing so much traction that, that it's been getting on things like Twitter and, and the internet has been a reminder about how global our struggles are and so the gentrification of a of a of a building in of, a, of an estate in West London is a linked struggle with the area boys in, in Lagos having yeah. accommodation similarly bulldozed and I'm I guess I'm optimistic that I, as our ideas of home become more global we are we see those we can see those links a little bit mm -hmm. more. Yeah. Um, yeah. More poems in your? Yeah. 
Um, I'd like to read um, a couple more poems from um, the actual, um, which is the book that just came out. Bridget, could you hold it up again? Um, just the so book. See. Yes, please hold the book up. <laughs> Thank you. It's black and gold. <laughs> you, do, do I have a copy close to hand and you don't have a copy of yours? I, I have. It's just on the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Well, this is what I'm here for as your helpful host. <laughs> the book. I, there. Better? Is that enough? <laughs> Yeah, that's beautiful. Wonderful. Do you want me to do you want to do you want me to find the page and people can read along? <laughs> Forget the captioning. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, the poem is called The Mandela Effect. And um oh, that's right by the beginning, I can find that. Yeah, it's one of the earliest. I think it's the third is yeah, is the third poem in the sequence of poems. And um and it's written um and in, invokes some of the imagery from Daniel Smith's um um, previous um, collection, um, and um, and this is this is this is it. The Mandela effect. Fuck the Mandela effect. Noun, definition, confabulation, collective misremembering of events or details, named after an imprisoned African activist, thought deceased in the mid '80s, who, when released later, led his nation. Tell me how it is possible to forget a country-sized man, how one misremembers mountains breathing. Black men are killed so often, it's assumed we've already passed. Whole white worlds imagine us in coffins, our skin the color of stained wood. No wonder police have skittish fingers. How else would you react to a corpse walking? Wouldn't you think yourself seeing things? Perhaps the wicked metal of a gun, a knife's simmering silver smile, even in our open palms, our fingers splayed like an asterisk to draw attention to our humanity, our black lives still mattering. Let them call us nigger. We can reclaim such cruel breath in verse. Let them raise our villages to dust. We will sculpt the mud to houses. Let them burn our sugarcane fields. We are already part molasses. To be black is to constantly achieve the improbable, to drive unchanneled through unchallenged through your own neighborhood, to return home safe with sweets, to keep your name intact, to be safe jogging, to breathe, to breathe, to breathe. But some miracles are better left performed once. Dear God of language and narrative, having sent back your patched up son, black, holy and bruised, Restrict some of that which you have given. Some folks are too loose with words. Don't let them call us dead. Mm. And um, the next poem I'm going to read is called um, Fox Sunflowers. And this is a meditation on, um, I guess, some of the, the video we just saw of Sana's meditation in the woods. Um, and it's about... Um, gentrification to a certain extent it's about home about safety about our relationship with the natural world and um this is it fox on flowers what i'm trying to say is kelechi hates sunflowers because tyrone grew obsessed after his class day trip to the countryside that first time he left the hawking concrete of his ends that afternoon where the sky enormous as it always is looked down on him Tyrone, for the first time, looked back as if into the face of God, properly studying its swoops and tonalities, the contours of the countries of clouds. And the force that rose in him to match his unblinking vastness brought him down to his knees, where he squelched his fingers into the good and clean earth, drilling his black thumb into the blacker soil. The teacher scolded him all the way home for his mud streaked seat and soiled trousers. What she didn't know is Tyrone had planted saplings of his spirit among the fields of barley and seeds of himself among the sunflowers. And these kept calling for him when they returned to the city of bricks, clawing for their kin. Though he filled his room with them, he couldn't match life out in the fields, the sky's unencumbered gaze over the choir of black faces, the petals like flattened crowns or ruffled halos. So Tyrone walked out his fourth floor window to join them, and Tyrone never came home. Mm. 
you very much, Inua. Thank you. Mm, I mean, um, I guess just quickly before we go into your last two poems, for those of you who are listening at home, watching at home who don't know, and who haven't got the actual yet, um, all of the poems begin with the word fuck. Um, and it's, yeah, it's something... Why, why that repetition, Inua? I'll keep it short. Why? Why the repetition? Um... Well, initially, um, I wrote the first poem after the American president had tweeted something else that I found offensive. And, and as a way of rebuffing him, I, I, I found all the insults that I could about him, all the riffs and all the puns of his name, and stitched it into this loose narrative. And I called that poem, um, Fuck, 40, um, Fuck Donald Trump. But I thought um, it was a little bit you know, nail on the head. So I, call, I recalled it, I renamed it Fuck 45. And then the way the poems all work is that they begin with this huge, powerful declarative statements, but the mm -hmm. poems sort of slowly fall and implode in, and they begin from anger, but kind of shift into something much more nuanced and subtle. And that is how the entire um, book um, it's kind of structured and we've we, especially in the last couple of years we've found ourselves increasingly increasingly drifting into reactionary um, um, politics where we find headlines and quickly react to it whenever you know to the point where Twitter had to change the policies now if you mm -hmm. read something now you have to include a you have to you have to include a quote or you have to say something about what it is you're retweeting which means that it's forcing us to read articles not just react to things so I think I was trying to use that device to create a spark of intensity with the poems, but when you begin to lean into them, they sort of bloom and become something else. And that is why they're all deliberately called fuck. It's, it's, mm -hmm. the, it's the spark of, uh, you know, something. And then when you, when you the, the poems just drift into something else. Um, so fuck, I love sunflowers, by the way, but um, sunflowers in the poem um, are evocative of just so much more. Yeah. But fuck them anyway. But fuck them anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, can we have your last poems, please? Yes. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh. Sorry to jump in. Before we move on, can I ask if you have a favourite title um, of, of your pieces? Oh, my God. Um, I haven't been asked that. Um, yes. <laughs> um, I have all the titles. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> I was just really curious. Um, let me see. Um, oh, there's so many. Fuck love, um, mm -hmm. which is a really classic. Uh, yeah, <laughs> classic, <laughs> and it's it's really about uh, my family and the va the various ways in which I love them or I fail to love them. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I really like. Um, oh my god, oh, that's a really tough question. Um, fuck carrots. It's is <laughs> that that is um yeah that that is actually about something that happens in the poem. So it okay. isn't just the title, and it's um it has a sort of subtly section explicit reference. Um, but it all makes sense when you read the poem. So maybe fuck pirates because there's like a double entendre involved mm. in the title. Yeah, but yeah, I think yeah that's probably my my favorite title. But I don't think it's my favorite poem in the collection. Right. Loving parrots. Uh, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> um, I'm going to read um, an old poem now um, called Clubbing. Um, it's also about home. And after a while of being a black writer, someone asks you to write about the slave trade. <laughs> it just comes. Um, and I refused and wrote about clubbing instead. And this is, this is that poem. It begins with shackling necklaces across throats. The distorted custom of wearing amulets to battle, talismans to war. We are new hunters, wear jeans for camouflage, clutch mobile phones like spears, journey to the village, town, city, square, and meet the rest of the tribe, mostly in short skirts, armed with stilettos, armored by Chanel. Dusk thickens. The customary bickering between us commences through the jungle vines of power lines, stampede of zebra crossings, night growth of street bustling. A ritual is natural till the traders come. 
greater armed, they divide with such ease that most of us are taken. Those who resist are swayed by liquor deals, still to darkness where the master spins a tune, not our own. We move stiffly to it as minds force indifference, but spines have a preference for drums. Rage building, we make our melody, fight to find our feet until the master tries to mix our movements with his song. But the rhythm is uneven and the tempo wrong. Against its waves, we raise voices in anger, fists in protest, dancers in the tide, militant against the music, a million men marching through seas. But we still know how to cross water. The ocean holds our bones, explains our way of navigating past bounces like breeze into night air where clouds pass like dark ships and find us beached, bent with parched lips, loose limbed and looking to light. Now, the best thing about clubbing is not this or the struggle to make hips sway just so, or the need to shout cloakrooms as if through underground railroads. No, the best thing about clubbing is the feeling of freedom on the bus ride home. Mm. And um, the last poem I'm going to read um, is from a sequence of 20 short poems that I wrote um, about journeys, about traveling, about seeking, seeking home. Um, and um, I wrote this for, for um, a hotel. This is when I was deeply capitalist. Well, maybe I still am. Nigeria <laughs> kind of are a little bit. Um, um, a sequence of 20 short poems just about, about journeys and about travels. And I, I'd like to read um, um, the second one. Um, this is it. Um, the second poem. All trains find stations. All doctors find patients. All water finds roots. All feet find boots. All pencils find cases. All sighs find spaces. All bees find hives. All birds find skies. All kings find thrones. All roads find homes. All sailors find shores. And this one is yours. <laughs> What a sweet note to end on. Again, God, why, why was I expecting to like, oh, I mean, not that there wasn't any darkness, but I was like, here back in you are like, let me fortify, my, let me fortify myself for this like gut-wrenching, like shoveling of, of, of the self. But instead you both <laughs> left us on a lovely note. And I, you know, more for me, for thinking anything else. Can you can only link up and we're like, yeah, let's surprise Bridget this time. <laughs> <laughs> something out the bag for her <laughs> so, love and happiness uh oh, inya that was lovely thank you so much for your set um and what a lovely note to end on i actually won't don't think there is too much to say after that because i think that is a really nice note to end on um to everyone listening at home thank you so much for being watching at home as well thank you so much for being here with us virtually for finding our home with us in the words and the conversation and all of the things in between. Um, Hibak, Osman, thank you so much for reading your beautiful poems. In your Ellen, thank you so much for reading your beautiful poems. Um, before we go, one last tiny, teeny question to you both. Um, who writes about home in a way that you like? Share the love. Hibak, in your either of you, feel free to give a name to the masses. Mm. Oh, wow. Um, can I include novelists? Yeah, anyone you want. Okay, I'm just gonna grab her book from my shelf. One second. Oh my god, he's off. He's he's running. He's running. <laughs> Let me see if I can think. Um, the problem is I haven't been doing much reading lately. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, I haven't. There's a uh, pandemic. Like, yeah. world is ending. <laughs> you know, like, no, yeah. yeah. Or music, I'll take. Mm. Music, yeah music anyway who's your who, what's your book um so this is sent this is set quite a while ago but this is the way she writes about her home is incredible this is by maza mengiste the book is called the shadow king mm. oh god so she's a novelist but this book is written with sensuous knowledge it is fluid it is rhythmic it, it is poetic it is mm. it, it uh sometimes it feels like the words are hugging you 
into the story, pulling you in. It's written. It's it's like you're in. You're you're being danced with. The story dances within you. It's 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 incredible. I've never. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I want to borrow that from you, Nia. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're back. Um, I'll also go with a novelist. One thing that I did read <laughs> this year <laughs> was um, The Mothers by Britt Bennett. And mm. I think that was one of the most sort of beautiful, firstly one of the most beautiful things I've read, but also one of the most sort of beautiful tellings of a community story and, and also just the narration of, of the mothers throughout the book um, really did remind me of, of this idea that that home sometimes isn't even something that you choose for yourself really but where other people place you and mm. how the main character wasn't really part of their home until she was and then she wasn't and I think that stuck with me for a long long time so I'll say beautiful. yeah the mothers that is beautiful home is a place that it wasn't and then it was and then it was wasn't again that that is a perfect note to end on I think so many people listening and watching will understand that too um Thank you so much one last time. Uh, if you are joining us from YouTube, please make sure you join us next week uh, for series three, episode three, with two eternal faves, Malika Booker, recent forward prize winner, and Keisha Thompson, who just won something else, but I've forgotten exactly what it was because I saw it literally when I was scrolling before I was getting ready for this, but it was something cool. Um, so yeah, two brilliant poets coming to us from the north. I'm very excited. Uh, see you next week.